Good morning. How good it is to see you all this morning gathered on a beautiful day to worship the Lord. How many of you are thankful to be here this morning? How many are thankful for the sun that's shining? Amen. For the blessing of a beautiful day. I want to welcome you to the house of the Lord and give God praise and thanks for you and your desire to worship God. Perhaps today you are checking in via Facebook and later in the afternoon on YouTube. I want to uh, give God thanks and praise for all those uh, viewers and worshipers uh, who are uh, away or at home this morning, some at the lake, some in other parts of the country and world. We want to welcome you to worship. I want to encourage you to know that as a gathered group of individuals, whether here in person or wherever you may be this morning, the call of the psalmist is this, oh, give thanks to the Lord. And I want to tell you that ends with an exclamation point, not a semicolon, not a comma, not a dash. Oh, give thanks to the Lord as if that's all that we're called to do in this day is to give thanks to the Lord. And that's a great place to start. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among all people. Sing to him. Sing a psalm to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Now, there are plenty of us who love to talk. But the psalmist reminds us, and I'm one of them, the psalmist reminds us of that task is not just to talk, church, but to talk about the wondrous works of God. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who rejoice, let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. So as you've come to worship this morning, my prayer is that you, coming to worship, long to talk about the goodness of God, long to hear about the goodness of God, desire to be filled and renewed and transformed this morning so that your hearts rejoice in the Lord and the Lord alone. Amen? That's a lot to be done in this morning. So I invite you to be prepared for all that. As you've come to worship, you were greeted and you were offered an opportunity to connect and belong this day, a guided tour, you might say, to what it looks like to be one who worships the Lord. I would invite you to take your bulletin with, uh, from in front of you there, open it with me quickly to be about the business of the church, uh, our guided tour and how we connect and uh, gather to be the body of Christ, not only today, but in the week to come. Two things I want to highlight, and I want to remind you that your bulletin is full of information. But two things I want to highlight. One is, we have just one week left to collect things for the Interna International Rescue uh, Committee that we are preparing uh, to send gifts to. You'll note in the narthex a, a slew of items have, have been collected. Thank you. Uh, Jan Nicoly took some donations and went out shopping this week and purchased five new vacuum cleaners along with some brooms and mops. So if you'd like to donate to that, find the information in the Narthex or in the Information Center, and please continue to give. I'm so appreciative of the ways that Beulah is the hands and feet of Christ. And also, we are preparing for a change of slides. Beulah Day, and we're going to be a part of that planning together by uh, ordering T-shirts. We have forever had wonderful T-shirts that identified us as the people who are here at Beulah Church, and we're gonna give you an opportunity to get new t-shirts, new water bottles, new umbrellas, and new things to come as we move into the future. But a way we wanna celebrate Beulah Day is by purchasing shirts and wearing those shirts. You know that we wear these shirts on any opportunity to be in mission and connection in the community, whether it be a, a outreach like our Easter egg hunt or vacation Bible school or fall festival or living nativity or trunk or treat. Uh, we wear these t-shirts to identify us so that our guests feel welcome uh, and see us as an opportunity to uh, give direction. So if you would like to purchase one of these shirts, information's in the Information Center. Uh, we'd like for you to get one of those shirts to identify yourself. The back of the shirt uh, names our mission statement, Transforming Lives as We Seek, Share, and Serve God. Uh, our second announcement ties directly into that is Beulah Day. We are celebrating Beulah Day this year uniquely as a homecoming event. Uh, we have prepared, we have met together on many occasions to prepare for this day. We have great music, we have great preacher sermon prepared, we have uh, guest musicians, we have catered lunch, we have uh, dinner on the grounds, and some of you said, I said this last week, we don't want to sit on the ground, don't worry about it. We're going to have a picnic table provided for about a hundred and some odd people. We're going to have picnic tables for you to sit on outside to listen to music or bring your own chair or blanket. Uh, but it's going to be a wonderful afternoon of celebration. And we did confirm a soft serve ice cream truck under the breezeway for chocolate and vanilla ice cream and sprinkles and all the things you'd like to go on that. And I want to remind you that it's at no cost. 
This is a celebration. We've had Sunday school classes and circles who've donated money uh, to help provide for Beulah Day, so we're going to have a grand celebration. Our celebrating of old tradition and new beginnings. Uh, so please mark that date on your calendar. If you have not yet signed up in the Information Center, it's simply RSVP, I will be here. That gives us an idea of how many people to prepare food for. And remember, we'll not just prepare for those who've signed up, but additional food to cover uh, all those who may just come on Beulah Day. So mark your calendar and be in the business of inviting folk to come along. So I'm excited about what's happening in the next few weeks. With the business of a church behind us, knowing that your bulletin will be your guide for the week, I would invite you now to stand with me. As you are able, we're going to be called officially to worship. I like a call to worship. A call to worship says, okay, we've done all these things in this week. We've been busy in this week, but now we're going to be officially called our attention for the purpose of worshiping. And you'll find that uh, call to worship in your bulletin this morning and also printed for you. I will be your leader and we'll respond together as the people. The Lord reigns. Let the people tremble. God's let the earth quake. God is exalted above all the peoples. God is holy and just, worthy of our praise, church. We gather our voices to praise God and you alone, O oh Lord. I want to invite you to remain standing, and we're going to sing a favorite hymn of the church. It's a hymn that I've sung all my life as a little child growing up in the church. I remember my mother and grandmother singing, Oh, how I love Jesus. Anybody love Jesus this morning? Well, let's put a smile on our face and a song in our heart. We're going to sing together all three verses. It's found in the red hymnal there in your pew, number 170. The words projected for you as well. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds just like music in my ear. For you see, it's the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Let's lift our voices this morning, church, as we announce to the world that we love the one named Jesus. There is a name. hearts, our souls, our bodies, all of who we are, God, we love you. We thank you this morning that that proclamation of love comes first because you loved us. We thank you that while we were let lost in ourselves, God, forsaken in our sin, you loved us enough 
to give us the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who makes that love a reality, God. We thank you for that foundational love on which we built our lives, on which we stand this morning and proclaim, we love you, God, and we've first been loved by you. We thank you, God. I pray this morning for the move of your Holy Spirit, God. From that same love that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, a move of that same love and the gift of your Holy Spirit, God, to be at work in this space today, captivating the hearts and the minds and the ears of your people, God, so that the proclamation of our mouth would not only be, I love Jesus, but the proclamation of the living of our lives would be, we love Jesus. We praise you and we thank you, God, and invite that you hear our prayer and send your Holy Spirit. In the name of Christ our Savior, we pray. And let the people of God say amen. amen. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and body, I would invite you to look at your neighbor left and right and maybe behind you and in front of you and say, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. And you may be seated. How many of you let Jesus know in this week that you love him? We let the people in our lives who are important to us know we love them. And I think love is better demonstrated than heard, right? The way we love is better seen in what we do than what we hear. Because we've said it before, right here in this space, sometimes what we say is not equal to what we do. But God, we love you. So let the living of our lives today demonstrate that love for you. I want to remind you that church, we are a loving church because we have first been loved. And we know that we are loved because we have a relationship with the one who dies and rose for our sake, Jesus. And we sing that we love Jesus this morning from a personal relationship, a basis, a foundation of that relationship. And we know that any good relationship finds as its basis communication. And the way we communicate with God on a daily basis is through the study of his word, through communication of prayer, through listening to the voice of God. This morning in our teen Sunday school class, we talked about the word discernment. What does it mean to be a discerning person? It means that in your relationship with God, you're not doing all the talking, but you equally do the listening. God, I'm discerning that you be in my life the guiding, the wisdom that I need to make good, wholesome, Christ-like decisions. I want to be a discerning person. That comes from an open line of communication. We are communicating church with God through prayer. And this morning, I want to remind you that we're going to go to the Lord in prayer in just a few moments. We're going to give God praise for goodness. We've sung already this morning, we love you, Lord, and we love you because you first loved us. And we're so very blessed. And perhaps during our time of prayer this morning, you want to give God praise. And I'm going to pause and say, God, hear the praises of your people. And you just let it flow. God, I love you and praise you for this, that, and the other because you're good. And we're going to pause in that same prayer and say, God, just as we acknowledge that your love is an evident gift, we also need strength because we're having a difficult time. And we're going to name before the Lord all the prayer concerns of our hearts and lives. We're going to pray for our sisters in Christ and brothers in Christ, Hilda Taylor and Patsy Hayden and Karen Clanton and, and all those individuals who are in need of prayer the Huban family and Pam Mays and Arlene Mays and the list went out from our church this week, Pat, Pat Compton, the list went, went out from our church this week, but I want to remind you that that list isn't exhaustive. Everyone's names aren't there, but we as a church family communicate and know the needs. And so we want to be in prayer for those individuals and pray today for that open communication, God, where we understand the love that you've given us in Jesus Christ and then we live that blessing those in our lives around us, just like those on our prayer list. And so I'm going to invite you to join me in praise and prayer this morning, and then we're going to close our time. Church, not out of tradition. We don't pray the Lord's Prayer from tradition. We pray it as an obvious, obvious gift of God for us and an experience of a relationship. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your wonderful name. We're going to close our time in prayer this morning praying that prayer together. So let's go before the Lord in praise and prayer, remembering to give God praise and also committing to the Lord this morning the things that are heavy on our hearts. Let's give God praise, church. Oh, God, we thank you that in the quiet of this moment, you are God. God, your power and your presence is overwhelming. We thank you this morning that you are here, God. We do not need to invite you to show up. Oh, God, your presence 
It's around us. It's for us. It's in us. It's above us, Lord. It carries us. We thank you this morning for your overwhelming presence, for your power, God. We acknowledge it, and we thank you for your presence, Lord. We thank you this morning that in the quiet of this place, you are God. We thank you this morning, God, that in the quiet of this place, we can announce to not only one another, but to the world around us that we love you because we have first been loved by you. So hear the praises of your people this morning, God. We thank you that in this week, you have been God. You've shown up, you've been available, you've been a present reality, you've been our stronghold in the middle of the night. God, you've been our constant when fear and anxiety overwhelmed us, you were God. And we praise you for that. We thank you for answered prayer. We thank you for healing. We thank you for restoration. We thank you for renewal. We thank you for financial blessing and provision, God. You are God and we praise you this morning. We invite that you hear now the praises of your people. God, in your mercy, receive our praise. God, we thank you that in this week you have been our sustainer. You have been Jehovah Jireh, God who provides. God, you have been uh, Rapha, our healer. I thank you that as I've stood by the hospital beds of those, Lord, in recovery, you were there. As I sat in the homes of those, God, desperately uh, lost in the realities, uh, Lord, of grief, you were there. God, I thank you that you were with me as I stood by those who were preparing to receive their eternal blessing, God. You were there. I thank you this week when I heard the good news of new life in the womb of a young lady who so desired to be a mother, God, you were there. And we praise you. But in every area, Lord, of our hearts and lives, though we acknowledge that you are at work, God, we know that we have desperate need for renewal, for restoration, for healing, for forgiveness, Lord. We come before you and invite that you, God, hear the prayer concerns of your people, those printed in this week, those named already before you, and those hidden in our hearts this morning, God. Hear now the praises of your people. Hear the prayers of your people. And God, in your mercy, hear us. We thank you that you've given us words of promise and hope, the words of Christ himself teaching us how it is we know you, God. We know you as Father. So hear us now as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A part of the way, one of the ways we express our love for God is in the way we give of our lives and our hearts and tithe and offering. So I'd invite you to prepare the gifts of your hearts and lives this morning as our ushers come to receive those. Amen. I invite you to stand, church, as you are able for the singing of our doxology.
God, we lift before you the gifts of hearts and lives because we were first loved. It's a response of your goodness and love in our lives, God, and we say thank you. So receive these gifts and bless them, Lord. For in the world that surrounds us, we want to love you, not in word only, but in our actions and deeds. Find us faithful, we pray, as you equip us with these tools. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. I invite you to be seated, and as you're seated, our women's course will bring us an opportunity for meditation music just prior to Barry coming and reading our scripture from the book of Isaiah. So prepare yourselves to hear meditation music and then the word of the Lord from the book of Isaiah. Thank you, ladies, for that meditation music. I invite you now to hear the word of the Lord, church, from the book of Isaiah, chapter 58. If you have your Bible this morning, verses 8 through 12, the words are also for you on the screen. Hear now the word of the Lord. Then your light, then your light will break forth like dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger, and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry, 
and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Barry, for reading the word for us this morning. I pray that, church, you have been a student of the word in this week. Uh, we have uh, yet to um, be invited. Uh, we are invited each week to be students of the word. If you have not picked up your Bible challenge for the month of uh, April and May, you can do so in the Information Center. I had the great opportunity this past week to uh, speak at the Gideon's Pastor's Appreciation Lunch. Uh, here in Chesterfield County. Uh, I was invited to be the guest speaker with the connection through uh, Lorraine Spencer's cousin, uh, who has served as a Gideon in the community, provided Bibles for us for our outreach event. Um, and I had the great opportunity to share how the whole of my life has had at some point in my life a connection to the Gideons. Uh, I remember receiving my first New Testament when in elementary school. I remember how important that little Bible was to me. It was in the local elementary school through a weekday religious education program uh, that may exist only in southern states, but you could actually leave the classroom and go to a Bible class uh, on the property of the school. It was there that I was given a New Testament Bible uh, for the first time. I had my little own little Bible. Now, I was too young and could not read the Bible, but I treasured that little book. It was important for me. Uh, you all know my story that uh, it was through the local church, through Vacation Bible School, that I was uh, introduced to the love of God who loved me first. And I made a proclamation of faith at a very young age. Um, it was through the invitation that uh, my dad uh, began to attend church, became a Christian, and he became a student of the Word. Uh, he was very, uh, very devout student of the Word. One of the last pictures I have of my dad before he passed away um, with cancer was sitting in his recliner with his Bible and a notebook taking notes where he was studying the Word of God. That was his last pursuit, uh, announcing the goodness of God to everyone in his family with an opportunity to know Jesus as your Savior in studying the Word of God. And so the whole of my life has been around the Word of God. Uh, and so I had a great opportunity uh, as a child to hear the Word of God, understand the importance of the Word of God, and had that Gideon Bible. It was later in my life, a few years later, that I realized that Mrs. Ross, who was a Sunday school teacher that taught my Sunday school class and participated in Vacation Bible School where I met Jesus, her husband was a Gideon who had come to the local schools to hand out the Bibles. So that came full circle in my life, uh, the Ross family and that foundation in the Word of God. And uh, my wife's grandfather was a Gideon. Uh, we've always had a connection with the Gideons through uh, our ministry in Waynesboro and here in Chesterfield County. So uh, it was such a blessing to be able to share that testimony. And I gave a witness to those pastors and to those Gideons that we are a church that stands on the Word of God. First, the Word of God. Uh, that we are students of the Word of God and we have been pursuing the Word of God, studying it, Old Testament, New Testament, uh, and people were amazed. Uh, talked about purchasing more than 400 plus Bibles so far through the ministry of this church that we've distributed so that everyone can have the like Bible, the NIV, to be studying together. Uh, and what differences I've seen in the lives of you all uh, as we've become students of the Word. So I want to encourage you to continue to be students of the Word. We're in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is uh, one of my favorite Old Testament prophets. Uh, it's this portion of scripture that is, for me, the favorite in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 58. Because you know, if you've been reading along with us in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah is full of judgment. Isaiah can be really heavy because it's a response of the prophet of God, the very word of God, to God's people. Anyone who loves you will tell you when you make a mistake. Did you know that? Anyone who loves you will tell you when you make a mistake. And anyone who loves you will help you learn in that mistake. 
Now, sometimes it's hard to hear those encouraging words from certain people in our lives. Uh, But it's those people who love us the most who want to see for us the very best. And in a role of a parent, we know that we give direction to our, our, our children and our grandchildren, not because we want to see them suffer, but because we want to see them grow. We want to see them not make mistakes, but to correct those mistakes in a way that's life-giving for them. So Isaiah is a heavy book. It's full of judgment. It's full of naming rebellion. But it's also a book where we hear words of promise and hope. Anybody in need of words of promise and hope today? We're all in need of words of promise and hope. When I was reading this portion of Scripture preparing for the day, I thought about an inventory. Now, an inventory is an important thing, especially if you're a business owner. It's important to know your inventory. It reminded me of my days at the Piggly Wiggly. Now, many of you all may know the story of my life. I grew up and I got my first real job at the Piggly Wiggly. Does everybody know what a Piggly Wiggly is? A Piggly Wiggly is a grocery store, as we called it locally in the neighborhood, the Hog. I worked at the Hog, but it was the Piggly Wiggly, and it was there that I got my first real on-paper check. Now, I'd worked for local farmers, picking peppers and digging potatoes and hauling hay and stripping tobacco, and I was paid cash but it was a real bona fide check where the federal government took a part of what it was that I earned. It was a real check. And I was excited about that real check. The first real check I ever received, I was paid $1.86 an hour. Can you believe that? And so I was a ninth grade student. I didn't get to work a lot of hours. So I was really excited when that check seated $30 a week. That was exciting. With that $30, I saved and bought my first car. My first car payment, I think, was around $38 a month. And I struggled because I only made about $30 a week. And I had to buy clothing and shoes and all the fun things that teenage boys like to buy. But I remembered at the Piggly Wiggly, I started as a bag boy. And that first year, the next summer, they offered me a promotion. Going into the 10th grade, I would work in the dairy department. And a part of the responsibility of the summer job was inventory in the dairy department. I lay awake for weeks worrying about how it was I would inventory that cheese and butter and eggs and milk. Because you see, I wanted it to be right. If you don't get the inventory correct, one or two things happen. You have too much and it spoils or you don't have enough and the customers become angry. Do you know that? And you got to know the shelf life on all those products. Milk and cheese and butter and yogurt and eggs. All have a shelf life. It was a big deal. But I learned how to inventory and the importance of inventory. Currently in my house, the most important inventory is the grocery list. Anybody keep a grocery list? That's the most important inventory because if that grocery list does not have on it the necessities of life, guess what? In the Gibson household, we suffer. I heard my wife say this week to one of my children who failed to put something on the grocery list that he needed, that he was out of, and she said, did you put that on the grocery list? Did you write that on my list? So when my wife ventures out and she purchases everything we need as a family, If it's not on the list, guess what? She can't buy it. She can't get messages, mental telepathy from school to the Walmart to tell her what we need. It has to be on that list. The scripture text today, Isaiah the prophet says to the people, he challenges the people of God to take an inventory. He says, in the reality of how you've chosen to live your life, specifically in the area of worship, it's time for you to take an inventory or maybe to carry out a fiscal audit on your spiritual life. Anybody ever have to balance your checkbook? Or do you all spend aimlessly? You've got to know how much money's in the checking account before you can run the inventory list at Walmart. I remember in the old days when my parents received their checks in the mail and they would sit and balance their checkbook. Anybody remember those days? 
I can remember my mom feverishly checking every penny to make sure we had no overspent as a family. But that audit's important. Isaiah's asking the people of God to be mindful that in every one of our lives there comes a time for a spiritual inventory, an audit, how it is you're worshiping God and what your relationship with the one who loved you first looks like. So take an audit. Take an inventory, Isaiah says to the people of God. When reading the scripture, it sounds as if God's people seem to be devout. When I read this, I thought, wow, these people are on ball. They are devout. They are purposed. They're committed to worshiping God. They understand what it means to be a committed follower. The people appeared to be frequent. It happened on a regular occasion. They were consistent. They knew what they were supposed to do. Their worship and their prayers were just like textbook. It seems that they had a desire to do the right thing before the Lord, their God, and it seems that they're close to God. Isaiah 58, verses 3 and 4 says, Yet on the day of your fasting, fasting literally meaning you are withholding from yourself food so as to be directly intimately connected with God in a very spiritual way, intentional. On the day of your fasting, you do as you please and you exploit your workers. Is that the kind of fast you've chosen, says Isaiah? And there it is. There in a nutshell is the inventory or the spiritual audit of the people of God. It's easily seen, says Isaiah. It's become very apparent to me and to God, says Isaiah, That beneath the surface, your motives, the motives of your heart, in there lies the problem. The true motive of your heart. There's the problem. Isaiah challenges the people of God and us this morning with this. If your faith is an empty show or or if it does not reflect a true heart that's connected and in tune with God, what's the point? What's the point? The point, Isaiah says, if your faith is empty and shallow and is only equal to words and demonstrations of how it is you sacrifice for yourself, what's the point? In verses 3 and 5, Isaiah says, God's revealing a disconnect between their Sabbath worship and their everyday living. What they did on the Sabbath was for show. They were available. They were fasting, they were praying, they were announcing the goodness of God. And Isaiah says, but the challenge, the true audit, and the inventory of your life is what happens every single day. Not on the Sabbath only. Why, we fasted, they said. Have you not seen our fast? We've humbled ourselves before you. God, have you not noticed that we're fasting? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and you exploit other people. Your fasting, he says, ends in quarreling and strife and backbiting and gossip and shaking of wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I've chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves one day of their week? Is your worship one day of religious reflection or relational lifestyle? He asked the people, is your one day of worship a true religious reflection or does it tell me about a religious and relational lifestyle? The Israelites did not understand that sincere and authentic worship resulted in transformed behavior, church. They didn't get it. That real and sincere, authentic worship had a result should have a result in their life. He said the result of that is a transformed behavior, which means what? We ain't like we used to be. We don't think like we used to think. We don't react the way we used to react. We don't do the things we used to do. Why? Because we have a sincere and authentic understanding of worship that then results in a transformed behavior. How you worship the living God, the intention, the intensity of your worship really matters, says Isaiah. The intention and the intensity of your worship really matters. The frequency 
with which you worship God really matters. Worship is not a ritual or an act. It has, been, it has to be personal and relational. The whole of what Isaiah is introducing to the individuals and the community of God is this. Your decision to walk with God has to be an everyday choice. You choose it. Paul says you choose it just like you choose the clothes you put on. You're purposed in that. The old self, it's gone. The new self, I'm intentional that my worship will be sincere and authentic in God. It's going to transform my behavior. If there is indeed a child in your life who needs a behavioral adjustment, guess what? It's the role of the parent, the adults in the life of that child, to instruct them otherwise. Isaiah says, I am here to instruct you otherwise, that unless your worship is authentic and purposed with a transformed outcome and the reality of the behavior of your life, what's the point? It's useless. Worship is not a ritual or an act. It's personal and relational. In Romans 12, 1, the Apostle Paul writes, Offer your bodies, brothers and sisters, as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and your proper worship. Worship literally means the whole of who I am. Every day, God. My heart, my mind, my soul, my body, my resources, yours first. Paul says, your reasonable and proper worship. First Colossians 3.17 urges, whatever you do then, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The synopsis of my life, every single day, every word and deed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. From what? Sincere and authentic worship that transforms my behavior. What the prophet Isaiah is saying is that the apostles Paul is also saying is this. Act, worship cannot be an act. It's a way of life. It's who we are in response to the love of God that we've experienced first before we ever really understood it. It's our response. If your worship has become empty, how do you change that? The children of God, when they heard these words of encouragement, so how do we change that? If we really want our worship to be authentic and sincere, how do we change that? In verse 6 and 7 of 58, Paul says, Isaiah shows them that properly motivated worship results in two behavioral changes. He reminds the listener that God desires more than lip service. God calls us into a life of a relationship with him. God calls us not to empty show, but a life in its fullness, which should produce fruit, should involve others, and should be seen if never heard. So first, he says, we're motivated. The, worship, the results of worship in our lives and our behavioral changes is this. We have a fullness of life. There is a fullness of life that in us produces fruit that directly involves and impacts the lives of everyone around us. Two types of blessings, Isaiah unpacks here, described in verses 11 and 12. There's personal blessing, authentic and sincere worship's result is what? Personal blessing. Personal blessing. A fullness of joy that is ours. And... That personal blessing involves what? Isaiah says, God will strengthen you. God will strengthen you. And then there's a community blessing. God will make you like a refuge for others. Twofold, church. Sincere and authentic worship has twofold. Behaviorally changed, am I? There's a fullness of joy. In my life is a lifestyle of joy basically related to only the foundation of my worship. I am full of joy and I am strengthened to be purposed for the kingdom of God. When worship transform us, transforms us, we become agents of transformation. I read that this week and it spoke to me. And I want to read it for you again. When worship transforms us, we become agents of transformation. Anybody want to be an agent of transformation? When worship transforms us, 
We become agents of transformation. We have the great honor and privilege of being a part of the rebuilding and restoring of what sin has broken. Isaiah said, you get to be a part of it when you recognize and you understand sincere and authentic worship. You are transformed. Your behaviors are transformed. You're renewed. You're given strength. You become an agent of transformation. I want to ask you this morning, which of these blessings are most meaningful to you? You being strengthened? Or the rebuilding and restoring of what sin has broken? And our motive, if our motives are pure, if our motives are impure, misplaced, or misguided, not only will God be displeased with us, church, but we will also struggle. There will be no joy. There will be no fullness and joy. Have you ever met a Christian that had no joy? That is an oxymoron. If there is no fullness and joy of joy in the life of a Christian, go to the foundation of their understanding of worship. Is it a ritual? Is it a punching the time clock? Is it I did my deed? Or is it I understand authentic and sincere worship that transforms me? And in that transformation, I become an agent of transformation and I am full with joy. If there's no fullness, inventory the worship. Isaiah says if there's no joy, take an inventory and an audit of your worship. While our religious practice may appear perfect and acceptable, the reality is this, they become hollow. It's just an empty practice. God feels distant and we struggle to feel committed to the Christian community. Is that you this morning? God feels distant and you struggle to be committed to a Christian community. When our worship is superficial and, our sur- and it's just a surface act, it becomes easy for us just to walk away. Well, not important. Just a part of what I do. It's not all of what I do. It becomes less important. Well, I'll get around to that sometime. It's not, nece- it's not a necessity. Well, there are necessary things in life, but that's, mm, that's okay. It's just an occasional occurrence. We may call ourselves part-timers. I want to tell you this morning, and Isaiah speaks to it in truth here, church, part-timers don't have a fullness of joy. There is no fullness of joy. There is no strengthening. There is no agent of transformation for part-time worship. God said, if you want to know strength, if you want to be full, to be an agent of transformation, be sincere and authentic in your worship. Let it be the foundation from which all your joy flows is your relationship with God. The call of Isaiah is to reflect and consider where we stand with God. God desires more than lip service. God is calling us to a lives to live in relationship with him. God calls us not to an empty show, but a life that is full and abundant today. I know so many Christians who say, well, we'll have joy when we get to heaven. Oh, there'll be fullness of joy when we stand on the other side in glory. I don't want that. I want heaven today, church, and that's available. Christ says to the disciples who ask him in the book of Luke, when's heaven coming? He said, it's right now. Heaven is here. He ushered in the kingdom of God, and this is a foretaste of heaven. And whether you have a fullness of joy or not is your choice. It's your choice. Whether you are strengthened to stand as an agent of transformation, it's your choice. Whether you want your worship to be lip service and surface surface only, it's your choice. The call of Isaiah is to reflect and consider where we stand in light of worship with God. God desires more from us than lip service. God is calling us to live in a relationship with him. God calls us not to empty show but a life of abundant life today. Jesus says in John 10.10, The thief comes to steal and destroy and take from you your joy. But I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Abundant joy. Jesus gives us a similar invitation. Are you tired, he says? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me, all who are weary. Get away with me. Worship me. Know me personally. It's Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 paraphrased. 
Prayerfully consider your motives for your religious actions and your practices. Why do we do what we do? Making necessary adjustments will bring out the best in your life and will help you join in the mission of God of rebuilding and restoring broken lives, church. Does your worship on Sunday morning affect the way you live your life? Does your worship on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday affect the way you live your life? The challenge that Isaiah holds before the people of God this morning and us is this. God says it, shout it out, don't hold back. God tells Isaiah, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion. Their rebellion is not that they're fasting, doing the religious thing for their own intent and the same time oppressing others. Their rebellion is that they do all that with no purpose. They're fasting. They're doing the right thing. It's a religious thing, but church, it hasn't changed their lives. And it hasn't changed the lives of anyone around them. They still quarrel. They still fight. They still gossip. They still hate. They still have racist motives. They still oppress. They still keep from themselves the very best of what they have. And then God says, in doing so, so you shake your wicked fist at the heavens. Such fasting, says God, is not heard on high. Their voices aren't heard on high with such fasting. You see, Isaiah says, that's not the fast that God chooses. I don't know about you this morning, but I thought to myself sitting in my office this week, do my actions really align with and reflect what I claim to believe about God? Do every one of my actions really align with and reflect what I claim to be the truth of my life? Is there more contradiction in my life? Is the religious thing I'm doing for the benefit of welfare of others? Or is it mostly for me so that I can just do business as usual? We can gather every Sunday morning. We can say our prayers we can nod in agreement to every scripture that's read. We can sing our praises to God. But if those things don't govern and guide our actions in the world in the week, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. If we do not align our interest and our concerns with God's interest and concerns, if they're just merely self-serving words that make us feel better about ourselves, then Isaiah says that all falls on deaf ears. God isn't listening. Do I call what I do on Sunday acceptable to the Lord? I want it to be. I thought of a simple statement that I read in this week that really spoke to me, and I haven't stopped thinking about it. Maybe I should spend less time speaking the truth about God and more time doing the truth about God. Now, you know I'm paid to talk, so that says a lot. Maybe I should spend less time speaking the truth about who God is and more time doing the truth of who God is. What would that look like in my life? What would that look like in your life? What would that look like in the life of our community, church, if we spent less time talking about who God is and we spent more time living like God loves and lives? And Isaiah says, here's the response. If that is your choice this morning, here is what it looks like. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call on the name of the Lord and guess what? He will hear you. He will not only hear you, but he will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing of the finger and all that malicious, nasty talk, 
And if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry, satisfy the need of the oppressed, then your light, your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become as the noonday. The Lord will guide you always and will satisfy your every single need. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Doesn't that sound amazing? As a result of what? Authentic and sincere worship that changes the very behavior of who we are. Guides and governs my every action. Isaiah said, that's the response of authentic worship. Your light will break forth like the noonday sun. Your healing. The Lord will not only hear you, the Lord's going to say, here I am, look at me, I'm in your midst. He will strengthen your very frame like a well-watered garden, a spring whose water never fails. And then you and your people will raise up the age-old foundations. And you will be called the repair of broken walls and the restorers of streets. That's who I want to be. Church, that's who God's calling us to be through the prophet Isaiah. Sincere, authentic, guiding and governing our relationship is guiding us and governing us in our actions. God, we come before you this morning. Lord, after a week of conviction, having read your word and God being convicted to the core that my worship be authentic, that who I am be a reflection of the relationship that I have with you, Lord, not only what I want it to look like and what I want to say and do, but God, truly sincere and authentic. So that every part of my life, Lord, my behavior be guided and governed by you. I thank you for the words of Isaiah, God. And though they are heavy this morning, they yet bring joy and hope. God, all these beautiful promises that you say are ours are possible. God, help us to set aside the religious parts of who we are, Lord. The superficial parts. And help us to be those who desire to go deep in our relationship with you. So deep that God from us is the very light of the noonday sun shining. From us, God, we are restored from within us. God, our our frame is strengthened. Our behavior is, God, equal to that of who you are, Lord, like who you are. So that those around us never question who we belong to. We thank you that, God, the words of promise in the book of Luke tell us that your kingdom is already here. Help us to be a kingdom people, Lord ushering in every single day what that looks like. Forgive us, Lord, for we have been weak. Forgive us for where we have been shallow. Forgive us, Lord, where we are religious. Forgive us, Lord, where lip service has been our common practice. Forgive us where we try to impress, Lord. Forgive us where we try to be indulgent in how it is we look so that others see in us you. And let us really, Lord, reflect who you are. I pray that you would cover this church, Lord, and every person in this building today. Everyone within earshot of hearing on Facebook or YouTube, that God, we be a people of authentic and sincere worship. Transforming us so that we be transforming agents. God, we worship you and we praise you alone. We love you and God, it's our heart's desire that you be at work in us. Oh God, be at work in us. We love you. We thank you. And we offer our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. And if this word for you today is truth, let me hear you say amen. Amen. And I invite you to stand with me, church. I want to invite you to join me in singing. Worship, invitation, every promise that we can make, every prayer and every step of faith, every difference we will make, it's only by your grace, God. Every mountain we will climb, every ray of hope we shine, every blessing left behind, it's only by your grace. Grace alone which God supplies, strength unknown he will provide. Christ in us, our cornerstone, we will go forth in grace alone. Let this be our song of worship and prayer of our hearts today as we leave this place now. Sincere and authentic, governing us and guiding us, Lord. Let's sing together, Grace Alone, 2162 in the small hymnal there in your pew, the black hymnal, and the words on the screen.
go forth this morning in grace alone, I invite you to hear these words of blessing. Now to him who is able to strengthen you, to keep you from stumbling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, authentic, sincere fullness and joy. To God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Go in God's grace. Amen.